Good morning, and welcome to Memorial United Methodist. My name is Joe Cade. I'm the minister here. We're so grateful uh, that you've joined us today. We start a new series today. We had a great Sunday last Sunday with Bishop Williman, a great uh, crowd, a great turnout, great questions, and uh, I was entertained and uh, informed by what he said. It was a, it was a um, fun Sunday, and I'm grateful for your participation in that. We start a new series today. Consecration Sunday is on November 20th, which is five Sundays from today. So we're going to focus on our five practices of fruitful congregations, uh, something you've heard me say a number of times, ways that we can shape ourselves so so that no matter what size we are, uh, we are serving our community. Those five practices being radical hospitality. What can we do uh, to offer ourselves both online, digitally, before anybody ever comes, when somebody walks in the door and participates in our service and follow up. And so we're going to talk about radical hospitality today in worship. We're going to talk about passionate worship next week. We're going to talk about intentional faith development. And we have an announcement for that. Confirmation starts in January. And so if you have a child that's sixth grade or above that would like to participate, um, we have uh, we have two meeting times that are not connected. They're independent of one another. One was today at 10, and one is two Sundays from today at 5 p.m. during the normal Sunday night programming. So if you have a child that would like to participate or if you'd like to just hear more about it, if you'll come next two weeks from tonight, uh, Sunday night. We believe in mission and service. And if you uh, would like to help to continue to contribute to the cleanup effort of Hurricane Matthew, you can go to umcore.org or umbim.org. These are both United Methodist agencies uh, that help people uh, desperately need in relief. And our own uh, Reverend George Strait has a list um, from umbim that we can collect uh, to give to other people. So if you would like a copy of that list, we'll make sure we get that in the email to you uh, going out. We believe in generosity, extravagant generosity. And I want to remind you that we're picking our leadership for next year. So if you should get a call about that leadership, uh, we uh, hope that you'll say yes. We've thought about it a good bit as to what would suit you best. And if you are interested in leadership, um, be sure to let me know, let our staff know. We have a couple extras. Charge Conference is next week, directly following this service. Charge Conference is a United Methodist thing where you meet with your um, district superintendent and and you look at things that you've done in the past year, not necessarily a calendar year from last charge conference to this one, um, the baptisms that you've had, the new members that you've had, uh, the joys that you've had, um, and uh, you celebrate those that you've lost. And you also project towards next year uh, with your finances, with your leadership. And so um, you are uh, more than welcome to stay after worship next week for charge conference. We also uh, say goodbye today to our youth director, Paige Brooks. Paige has uh, been with us for two years. She's engaged. She's got tremendous news. Her husband, or to be her uh, fiance, Daniel, has a great job in Florida with his brother, and they are uh, moving to Florida. And so um, we celebrated her in the nine o'clock service today because she's uh, sung so many great songs in that service. We also have a drop-in um, this afternoon um, from 2:30 to 4 in the social hall um, uh, shower for them. And also the youth are doing a fun thing uh, tonight for Paige. Um, so if you see Paige today, make sure you say thank you uh, for her years of service uh, here. I believe that's all of our announcements, so I'll have you uh, stand if you're able and join us in our first hymn, of which we'll sing the two uh, English verses. <laughs> Number 434.
Let us now affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Our first scripture lesson today is from the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion... Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. This is the word of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for drawing us together to this place to sing your songs, to pray your prayers, to read your text, to proclaim your word. And as we read uh, what is a very familiar text, one of fatigue, one of confusion, one of fear of scarcity. Remind us of all the times in which we felt that as an individual, as a family, as a church. Remind us what the child offered. Remind us what Jesus did, what he takes with what he, we give him. Remind us of the amazing opportunity that we have to offer hospitality to another because you first offered it to us. Inspire us this morning, Lord, as we pray the prayer your son taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's now time for our tithes and other offerings. I'll remind you that we're going into a season in which we're giving everything of ourselves and our leadership and our time and our gifts and our presence. And on December 4th is going to be another opportunity for you uh, to join our church if you're so interested. If you would like to, if you'll please write our church office. You'll see the email at the bottom and we'll talk to you before December 4th. If you would like to give online, you'll see instructions on how to do that uh, in the bulletin and we encourage you to do so.
Please be seated. As I said before, we're going to talk about radical hospitality today. And we're going to look at a text that might be very familiar to you, but I think with a slightly different slant in a way that could be informative to us all. John chapter 6, starting with verse 6, the story of the feeding of the 5,000, way more than that, because that was just counting men. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you'd like to read along, I encourage you to leave your Bible open and we read more of that story. First phrase that I want you to notice in that text is, because they saw signs. People love a winner. That is, if it's the thing that they love. They get real tired of a winner if it's not the thing that they love. If something is going well and it's the thing that they are rooting for, love, love, love. Do another thing. Do another cool thing. Do another amazing thing. Win another thing. Say another thing. People really follow a winner. I'll give you an example. In 2007, I, did, uh, I went for continuing ed for a week in Chicago. Uh, every day we got out at 3 p.m., and some days I left at 2.59. And I was on the, uh, they call it the L, the train, you know, the elevated train at 3.01, going somewhere fun in Chicago to learn something, to see something. Um, I realized after the fact that it was a little focused on sports. The first time I went to a Cubs game, the next day I went to a White Sox game, the next day I toured Wrigley Field for three hours, and the next day I went to Soldier Field, the home of the Chicago Bears, and, and snuck in a little bit and to look around. I went two years later with Katie, my wife, to celebrate our 10-year anniversary, and we actually had some a little variety. We went to some museums and other cultural things uh, that Chicago has to offer. But the day that I was there and went to the Cubs game, it was 2.20 in the afternoon. It was 68 degrees. I had sunflower seeds and uh, Coke and baseball, and I thought, this is it. This is all there ever should be. And was, from that day, was a Cubs fan. But over time, between now and then, there were times when they had players that I wasn't a fan of. They didn't have great effort. They weren't very intelligent. They weren't sacrificial. They wouldn't do the things that the team needed them to do in order to win. And there'd be times when I'd fall off from them. But in the last three years or so, they've brought in people who are fits, who are talented, who know what they're supposed to do in a situation. And last night, even though they had not been in the World Series since 1945, I risked it and woke up Addison in the ninth inning and said, I want you to see the last three outs. This has not happened since your grandparents were one and two years old. I paid more attention last night than I did on, say, June 21st in 2009. Right? People love a winner. It really grabs their attention. It really pulls them back in. When you feel like you're struggling in different parts of life, you need something. If it's a release... That thing needs to be successful in order to help you feel better. The second thing I want you to notice, Passover was near. And I don't know if I've ever thought of it this way until I was looking at it this week. I've said this many times to you, Passover is a celebration of the people's liberation from Egypt through an extra long process of Moses negotiating with Pharaoh and all kinds of uh, uh, diseases and pestilence, all sorts of things, and then getting through the Red Sea. People celebrate the Passover every year. So what they're celebrating is being liberated from a location in which they were in slavery. And they're about to do it again in Jerusalem, which is their homeland. But what would be odd is that while they're not in slavery, having to build uh, all kinds of structures without bricks, they're occupied by the Roman government. So it's one thing to have a hard time on the road. What if it's not what you want it to be, not even close to what you want it to be, and you're at home? You're where you want to live. And so there's got to be all kinds of mixed feelings about celebrating the Passover with Roman occupation. And so all these people are pouring into an already busy town to celebrate this event. And I'm guessing they're a little grumpy. 
Verse 5. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward Him, He said to Philip, Where should we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test Him, for He already had in mind what He was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to simply have a bite. And I'll remind you that he asked them to leave their professions and follow him. And so income isn't really a strong point for them right now. We watch a number of shows on Netflix, my family and I do. One is called The Great Food Truck Road Rates. They take eight people, they might be family, they might be friends, they might be co-workers, and they have an interest in having a food truck. Many of you might not have eaten from a food truck, but it's a growing business all the way across the country. You'll especially see them in cities. And this show takes these people and gets their dream concept and makes a beautiful truck for them in that theme. If they want to have a barbecue theme, they make them a truck based on barbecue. If they want to have a a pizza theme, they make them based on pizza, whatever it may be. And they show them their dream. And they go all the way across the nation for eight to ten episodes. And in each city, they give them a crazy competition to see who can get the most money in their till. The one with the lowest amount gets eliminated until they're on the East Coast and there's two teams left. The winner of which gets to keep their truck and $50,000 to start their business. Now, the interesting part of this show is that they pit people against one another that are very different in their backgrounds and also in their culinary interests. The other thing is these people are accustomed to doing just a couple things. Backyard barbecues for their family who loves them. Uh, uh, parties, uh, um, weddings, maybe with 100, 150 people. Something where they control the environment. But these people not only are not in their own city, they're in a truck that they're borrowing, they're in a location that they do not know, and the show will often put a twist on them and say, actually, you can't cook your favorite thing today, you got to do something a little different. And that's the show. And what you learn is... Uh, these culinary newbies get a little overwhelmed when there's a big line. And you know what? I get it. I was a server at both Applebee's and Chili's, and when a bus would pull up when I already had five tables, I would think. Oh, man. New things, new locations, new conflicts, all equal reduced patience. Y'all are familiar with this? This is not a crazy concept for you to try to understand. The disciples are quite similar to those contestants. They've left home. Now they are doing the thing that they knew in their heart they wanted to do. But they've left home. They're with people that they don't know. They're given new challenges all the time. And crowds come at them that they cannot handle mentally or emotionally or physically. And guess what? Large crowds test us. Whether we are in leadership or whether we are not in leadership. Let's look at verse 8. Another one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There's plenty of grass in that place. And they sat down, about 5,000 men were there. So add their, many of them, their wives and their children to that number. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. So the phrase I want you to notice this morning about that section is, here is a boy. That's as specific as it gets. Two very critical points about that phrase. Number one, he's nameless. Do you know how much effort the Bible goes to naming people? both their their name, their parents' name, and their location. You know how often we do that? If y'all, were, if y'all saw me in public and you were with a friend, we were at the grocery store and you said, oh, this is my minister, uh, Joe, of Bob, of Knoxville, Tennessee. <laughs> no, you would never do that. But they do that all the time. They want to note all the time who is your family and where are you from. So what does it mean that when Jesus tells a story, when Jesus is involved in a story, very rarely is it about that individual or where they're from or who they are. 
I'll give you some other examples. The woman at the well. What's her name? Centurion, soldier. Anybody know his name? Mm -mm. Good Samaritan? He did a pretty good thing. Anybody know his name? Mm -mm. In both real events and parables to establish real concepts, many, many times the person is nameless. It's about the story. It's about what Jesus did. The second thing about this is what children can teach us. What can children teach us about being friendly and offering something to another person? Well, number one, how do they greet you? Children. When you walk in the door. Do they lose their mind? Yes. Do they lose their mind at the door, in the parking lot, at the school, at the church? Whatever it may be, when you walk in, they are excited that you are there. If they had a tail, it would be wagging. And they're excited and they want to tell you something. What do they want to tell you? They did something. That's the other thing. They are fearless in what they have to offer. I watch people pick up every day here at 2 and at 5. And the child has something. They drew a walrus today. It's sort of a walrus, right? But that child is fearless in their walrus that they drew for you. I want to show you my walrus. At some point, we get a little scared about that. About what our talent is and who we are offering that to. So, you got all these people. The disciples think there's way too many people. In fact, even after he says this child has this, he says, well, how far will that go? But the child offers it. Fearlessly. This is the thing that I have to offer. Let's look at verse 12. When they had had enough to eat, he said this to his disciples. Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. You know how many times he either weaves through them or goes in another direction based on them wanting to do something violently, a good thing or a bad thing. Their responses to him are just dramatic, dramatically up and down. So the thing I want you to notice about this is holy patience. Because a couple of verses down the road, this is what happens. Verse 28. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works of God requires? What do I have to do? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. What do we have to do? Jesus says, I want you to believe. Their response to him saying, I want you to believe is this. What sign will you give us that we may see it and believe in you? I need you to be aware of what we've done. I just fed 75, 8,000, 9,000 people with very little food. You know what happens in between the story we read and them saying, hey, can you show us something so we can understand? Jesus walks on water. But the people say again and again and again, can you show us something cool so that we can believe in you? If someone said that to you and you had already shown them something and said your only job is to believe, what would that do to your heart and to your mind? It'd be hard, wouldn't it? It'd be hard if they kept saying, give me another thing so that it will be easy to believe who you are. And that's the phrase that I want to stick with you going forward from today. Holy patience. This is how I want you to use it. Holy patience. Y'all ever say that? No. We've said some things like that. But have we said, holy patience. 
<laughs> but I want you to think about it. I want you to say it because it will remind you of this text. When you think that someone doesn't know what they're doing, and here they are impacting your life, think about the way in which Jesus interacted with these people. When you think that someone's faith is not as strong as yours, when you think that someone's words were a little incendiary, were a little hurtful, were maybe something that no one who's ever joining in our worship services should ever say, and you think, that's it with that person. I want you to think about that phrase. I want you, when you see an animal that's not listening, a child that's not listening, an adult that's not listening, a parent that's not listening, a neighbor that's not listening, a co-worker, a person in traffic. <laughs> Holy patience. Remember what Jesus did for those people. Remember how you can offer it. Because if you can remember that, if you can offer it, You'll be offering hospitality to another person in the way in which it was offered to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand and join me as you're able with number 454. So grateful for all of you for coming to worship today. If you're a guest today, we're so grateful to have you. If you're willing uh, to stay after worship, after the handshakes, I can show you around campus and answer any questions you may have. Go in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit go with you all. Amen.